Six, Kafka, Three Parables. Preface. Franz Kafka was born in Prague in 1883 and died in 1924. He published some short pieces, including The Metamorphosis, but did not finish or try to publish his two major works, The Trial and The Castle. In fact, he tried to destroy the manuscripts, and it was against his instructions that Max Broad published them after Kafka's death. Broad's arrangement of the various chapters has been challenged, and his interpretations in his postscripts and biography are, I think, and by no means only I, untenable. But everybody who admires Kafka is in Broad's debt. Among the most important documents for the interpretation of the castle are the following three parables. They are also excellent illustrations of Kafka's style, simple, seemingly also artless prose that stirs intelligence and heart at once and transposes us into a Kafkaesque world. The translations are less than perfect. Anyone who reads a little, even a little German, should try the original, but Kafka's world is there. The last sentence of the second parable has been definitely mistranslated. Die Lüge wird zu Weltenung gebracht means the world order is based upon a lie. Even in translation, these short parables satisfy as perfectly as few works of world literature the high standards defined in Nietzsche's epigram. It is my ambition to say in ten sentences what everyone else says in a book. What everyone else does not say in a book, although there are few writers to whom this dictum is less applicable than to Kierkegaard and Jaspers, there are critics who admire all four, probably because they are so frank about the absurdity of man's condition. In the usual, in the usual exegesis, Kafka's castle stands for God. The hero is remote from God, while the people in the village are nearer to God and the problem is one of divine grace. At the beginning of the novel, however, we are told that the castle is the castle of Count West-West, and after that, the Count no longer figures in the story. The German West means decomposes. I suggest that in the castle, God is dead, and we are faced with a universe devoid of sense. The villagers are not close to God, in the words of Nietzsche's madman in the gay science. See above. This tremendous event has not yet reached the ears of men. They do not understand their situation. Thus the emperor has died in the first parable, and in the last parable there are no kings, and the courtiers shout messages that are meaningless. In one of Kafka's notebooks, finally, in number four, we find one page we find a one page sketch from which I quote The old count, to be sure, was dead, and so the young one should have reigned. But it was not that way. There was a pause in history, and the deputation went into emptiness. Kafka stands between Nietzsche and the existentialism. He is he pictures the world into which Heidegger's man, Sein und Zeit, is thrown, the godless world of Sartre, the absurd world of Camus. The discussion of the parable about the law in the trial is no less important. It is Kafka's broadest hint about his method and his meaning. In his simplest style, comparable to the book of Genesis, he fashions stories which, like those of Genesis, invite a multitude of different interpretations, and he does not want to be reduced to one exclusive meaning. As we read and reread the beginning of the castle and compare it with the variant beginning printed at the end of the book, it becomes quite clear that Kafka went out of his way to rule out any possibility of one exclusive exegesis. Ambiguity is of the essence of his art. At the end of a half page on four variants of the old myth of Prometheus, Kafka writes in his third notebook, the myth tries to explain the unexplainable. As it comes out of a ground of truth, it must end again in the unexplainable. It is for the sake of truthfulness that Kafka eschews reduction to a simple explanation. The world that confronts us and our life in it defy every attempt at a compelling exegesis. That life lends itself to many different interpretations is of its essence. Kafka is no obscurantist or authoritarian. His intelligence is bright and critical and clear.
and in his majority words, no less than in his letter to the Father, he points to the faults and filth of those who command authority, and he does not demand submission, let alone a sacrificium intellectus. Surely, Kafka would have agreed that, although critical intelligence is not sufficient to redeem humanity from misery, those who renounce it are heading from the frying pan into the fire. 1. An Imperial Message the Emperor, so it runs, has sent a message to you, the humble subject, the insufficient shadow cowering in the remotest distance before the Imperial Sun, the Emperor from his deathbed, has sent a message to you alone. He has commanded the messenger to kneel down by the bed and has whispered the message to him. So much store did he lay on it that he ordered a messenger to whisper it back into his ear again. Then by a nod of the head he has confirmed that it is right. Yes, before the assembled spectators of his death, all the obstructing walls have been broken down, and on the spacious and loftily mounting open staircases stand in a ring the great princes of the empire. Before all these, he has delivered his message. The messenger immediately sets out on his journey, a powerful and indefatigable man. Now pushing with his right arm, now with his left, he cleaves a way for himself through the throng. If he encounters resistance, he points to his breast, where the symbol of the sun glitters. The way, too, is made easier for him than it would be for any other man. But the multitudes are so vast, their numbers have no end. If he could reach the open fields, how fast he would fly, and soon, doubtless, you would hear the welcome hammering of his fists on your door. But instead, how vainly does he wear out his strength? Still, he is only making his way through the chambers of the innermost palace. Never will he get to the end of them. And if he succeeded in that, nothing would be gained. He must fight his way next down the stairs. And if he succeeded in that, nothing would be gained. The courts would still have to be crossed. And after the courts, the second outer palace. And once more stairs and courts and once more another palace, and so on for thousands of years. And if at last he should burst through the outermost gate, but never, never can that happen. The imperial capital would lie before him, the center of the world, crammed to bursting with its own refuse. Nobody could fight his way through here, least of all one with a message from a dead man. But you sit at your window when evening falls and dream it to yourself. Two, before the law, before the law stands a doorkeeper on guard. To this doorkeeper there comes a man from the country who begs for admittance to the law. But the doorkeeper says that he cannot admit the man at the moment. The man on reflection asks if he will be allowed then to enter later. It is possible, answers the doorkeeper, but not at this moment. Since the door leading into the law stands open as usual, and the doorkeeper steps to one side, the man bends down to peer through the entrance. When the doorkeeper sees that, he laughs and says, If you are so strongly tempted, try to get in without my permission. But note that I am powerful, and I am only the lowest doorkeeper. From hall to hall, keepers stand at every door, one more powerful than the other. Even the third of these has an aspect that even I cannot bear to look at. These are difficulties which the man from the country has not expected to meet. The law, he thinks, should be accessible to every man and at all times. But when he looks more closely at the doorkeeper, in his furred robe, with his huge pointed nose and long, thin, tartar beard, he decides that he had better wait until he gets permission to enter. The doorkeeper gives him a stool and lets him sit down at the side of the door. There he sits waiting for days and years. He makes many attempts to be allowed in, and wearies the doorkeeper with his importunity. The doorkeeper often engages him in brief conversation, asking him about his home and about other matters. But the questions are put quite impersonally, as great men put questions, and always conclude with the statement that the man cannot be allowed to enter yet. The man who has equipped himself with many things for his journey parts with all he has, however valuable, valuable, in the hope of bribing the doorkeeper, the doorkeeper accepts it all, saying, However, as he takes each gift, I take this only to keep you from feeling that you have left something undone. During all these years, 
The man watches the doorkeeper almost incessantly. He forgets about the other doorkeepers, and this one seems to him the only barrier between himself and the law. In the first years, he curses his evil fate aloud. Later, as he grows old, he only mutters to himself. He grows childish, and since in his prolonged watch he has learned to know even the fleas in the doorkeeper's fur collar, he begs the very fleas to help him and to persuade the doorkeeper to change his mind. Finally, his eyes grow dim, and he does not know whether the world is really darkening around him or whether his eyes are only deceiving him. But in the darkness, he can now perceive the radiance that streams immortally from the door of the law. Now his life is drawing to a close. Before he dies, all that he has experienced during the whole time of his sojourn condenses in his mind into one question, which he has never yet put to the doorkeeper. He beckons the doorkeeper since he can no longer raise his stiffening body. The doorkeeper has to bend far down to hear him, for the difference in size between them that has increased very much to the man's disadvantage. What do you want to know now? asks the doorkeeper. You are insatiable. Everyone strives to attain the law, answers the man. How does it come about then that in all these years no one has come seeking admittance but me. The doorkeeper perceives that the man is at the end of his strength and that his hearing is failing, so he bellows in his ear. No one but you could gain admittance through this door since this door was intended only for you. I am now going to shut it. So the doorkeeper deluded the man, said Kay immediately, strongly attracted by the story. Don't be too hasty, said the priest. Don't take over an opinion without testing it. I have told you the story in the very words of the scriptures. There's no mention of delusion in it. But it's clear enough, said Kay, and your first interpretation of it was quite right. The doorkeeper gave the message of salvation to the man only when it could no longer help him. He was not asked the question any earlier, said the priest, and you must consider, too, that he was only a doorkeeper, and as such he fulfilled his duty. What makes you think that he fulfilled his duty? asked Kay. He didn't fulfill it. His duty might have been to keep all strangers away, but this man, for whom the door was intended, should have been let in. You have not enough respect for the written word, and you are altering the story, said the priest. The story contains two important statements made by the doorkeeper about admission to the law, one at the beginning, the other at the end. The first statement is that he cannot admit the man at the moment, and the other is that this door was intended only for the man. If there were a contradiction between the two, you would be right, and the doorkeeper would have deluded the man, but there is no contradiction. The first statement, on the contrary, even implies the second. One could almost say that in suggesting to the man that the possibility of future admittance, the possibility of future admittance, the doorkeeper is exceeding his duty. At that moment, his apparent duty is only to refuse admittance. And indeed, many commenters are surprised that the suggestion should be made at all, since the doorkeeper appears to be a precisian with a stern regard for duty. He does not once leave his post during these very many years. And he does not shut the door until the very last minute. He is conscious of the importance of his office. For he says, I am powerful. He is respectful to his superiors. For he says, I am, the, I am only the lowest doorkeeper. He is not garrulous for during all these years. He puts only what are called impersonal questions. He is not to be bribed. For he says, in accepting the gift, I take this only to keep you from feeling that you have left something undone. Where his duty is concerned, he is to be moved neither by pity nor rage. For we are told that the man wearied the doorkeeper with his importunity, and finally, even his external appearance hints at a pedantic character. The large pointed nose and the long, thin, black tartar beard. Could one imagine a more faithful doorkeeper, yet the doorkeeper has other elements in his character which are likely to advantage anyone seeking admittance and which make it comprehensible enough that he should somewhat exceed his duty in suggesting the possibility of future admittance, for it cannot be denied that he is a little simple-minded and consequently 
a little conceited. Take the statements he makes about his power and the power of the other doorkeepers and their dreadful aspect, which even he cannot bear to see. I hold that these statements may be true enough, but that the way in which he brings them out shows that his perceptions are confused by simpleness of mind and conceit. The commentators note in this connection the right perception of any matter and a misunderstanding of the same matter do not wholly exclude each other. One must at any rate assume that such simpleness and conceit, however sparingly indicated, are likely to weaken his defense of the door. They are breaches in the character of the doorkeeper. To this must be added the fact that the doorkeeper seems to be a friendly creature by nature. He is by no means always on his official dignity. In the very first moments, he allows himself the jest of inviting the man to enter in spite of the strictly maintained veto against entry. Then he does not, for instance, send the man away, but gives him, as we are told, a stool and lets him sit down beside the door. The patience with which he endures the man's appeals during so many years, the brief conversations, the acceptance of the gifts, the politeness, the politeness with which he allows the man to curse loudly in his presence, the fate for which he himself is responsible, all this lets us deduce certain motions of sympathy. Not every doorkeeper would have acted thus, and finally, in answer to a gesture of the man's, he stoops low down to give him the chance of putting a last question. Nothing but mild impatience. The doorkeeper knows that this is the end of it all, is discernible in the words, you are insatiable. Some push this mode of interpretation even further and hold that these words express a kind of friendly admiration though not without a hint of condescension. At any rate, the figure of the doorkeeper can be said to come out very differently from what you fancied. You have studied the story more exactly and for a longer time than I have, said Kay. They were both silent for a little while, and Kay said, so you think the man was not deluded. Don't misunderstand me, said the priest. I am only showing you the various opinions concerning that point. You must not pay too much attention to them. The scriptures are unalterable and the comments often enough merely express the commentator's bewilderment. In this case, there even exists an interpretation which claims that the deluded person is really the doorkeeper. That's a far-fetched interpretation, said Kay. On what is it based? It is based, answered the priest, on the simple-mindedness of the doorkeeper. The argument is, he does not know the law from inside, but he knows only the way that leads to it, where he patrols up and down. His ideas of the interior are assumed to be childish, and it is supposed that he himself is afraid of the other guardians whom he holds up as bogies before the man. Indeed, he fears them more than the man does, since the man is determined to enter after hearing about the dreadful guardians of the interior, while the doorkeeper has no desire to enter, at least not so far as we are told. Others again say that he must have been in the interior already, since he is, after all, engaged in the service of the law and can only have been appointed from inside. This is countered by arguing that he may have been appointed by a voice calling from the interior, and that anyhow he cannot have been far inside, since the aspect of the third doorkeeper is more than he can endure. Moreover, no indication is given that during all these years he ever made the, the one remark about the doorkeeper. He may have been forbidden to do so, but there is no mention of that either. On these grounds, the conclusion is reached that he knows nothing about the aspect and significance of the interior so that he is in a state of delusion. But he is deceived also about his reputation to the man from the country, for he is subject to the man and does not know it. He treats the man instead as his own subordinate, as, you can, as can be recognized from many details that must still be fresh in your mind, but according to this view of the story, it is just as clearly indicated that he is really subordinated to the man in the first place. A bondsman is always subject to a freeman. Now, the, the man from the country is really free. He can go where he likes. It is only the law that is closed to him. And access to the law is forbidden him only by one in individual, the doorkeeper, when he sits down on the stool by the side of the door and stays there for the rest of his life he does it of his own free will. In the story, there is no mention of any compulsion, but the doorkeeper is bound to his post by his very office. He does not dare strike out into the country, nor apparently may he go into the interior of the law, even should he wish to. Besides, 
Although he is in the service of the law, his service is confined to this one entrance. That is to say, he serves only this man for whom alone the entrance is intended. On that ground, too, he is subject to the man. One must assume that for many years, for as long as it takes a man to grow up to the prime of life, his service was, in a sense, empty formality, since he had to wait for a man to come. That is to say, someone in the prime of life, and so had to wait a long time before the purpose of his service could be fulfilled, and moreover had to wait on the man's pleasure, for the man came of his own free will. But the termination of his service also depends on the man's term of life, so that to the very end he is subject to the man. And it is emphasized throughout that the doorkeeper apparently realizes nothing of all this. That is not in itself remarkable, since according to this interpretation, the doorkeeper is deceived. In a much more important issue, the doorkeeper is deceived in a much more important issue, affecting his very office. At the end, for example, he says, regarding the entrance to the law, I am now going to shut it. But at the beginning of the story, we are told that the door leading into the law stands always open. And if it stands all open always, that is to say, uh, at all times, without reference to the life or death of the man, then the doorkeeper is incapable of closing it. There is some difference of opinions about the motive behind the doorkeeper's statement, whether he said he was going to close the door merely for the sake of giving an answer, or to emphasize his devotion to duty, or to bring the man into a state of grief and regret in his last moments. But there is no lack of agreement that the doorkeeper will not be able to shut the door. Many indeed profess to find that he is subordinate to the man, even in wisdom, towards the end, at least, for the man sees the radiance that official position must stand with his back to the door. No, for the man sees the radiance that issues from the door of the law, while the doorkeeper in his official position must stand with his back to the door. Nor does he say anything to show that he has perceived the change. That is well argued, said Kay, after repeating to himself in a low voice several passages from the priest's exposition. It is well argued, and I am inclined to agree that the doorkeeper is deluded, but that has not made me abandon my former opinion, since both conclusions are to some extent compatible. Whether the doorkeeper is clear-sighted or deluded does not dispose of the matter. I said the man is deluded. If the doorkeeper is clear-sighted, one might have doubts about that, but if the doorkeeper himself is deluded, then his delusion must of necessity be communicated to the man. That makes the doorkeeper not indeed a swindler, but a creature so simple-minded that he ought to be dismissed at once from his office. You mustn't forget that the doorkeeper's delusions do himself no harm, but do infinite harm to the man. There are objections to that, said the priest. Many aver that the story confers no right on anyone to pass judgment on the doorkeeper. Whatever he may seem to us, he is yet a servant of the law. That is, he belongs to the law, and as such is set beyond human judgment. In that case, one dare not believe that the doorkeeper is subordinate to the man, bound as he is by his service. Even at the door of the world, the man is only seeking the law. The doorkeeper is already attached to it. It is the law that has placed him at his post. To doubt his integrity is to doubt the law itself. I don't agree with that point of view, said Kay, shaking his head. For if one accept it, accepts it, one must accept as true everything the doorkeeper says. But you yourself have sufficiently proved how impossible it is to do that. No, said the priest, it is not necessary to accept everything as true. One must only accept it as necessary. A melancholy conclusion, said Kay. It turns lying into a universal principle. Three. Couriers. They were offered the choice between becoming kings or the couriers of kings. The way children would, they all wanted to be couriers. Therefore, there are only couriers who worry, who hurry about the world, shouting to each other, since there are no kings, messages that have become meaningless. They would like to put an end to this miserable life of theirs, but they dare not because of their oaths of service. <laughs>